Hello everyone, for First Updates Now, I'm Tyler Olds, and you're watching Behind the Bumpers. It's a fun show where we dive deeper into robots and what makes them work. And today I'm here with team number 2337, the engineers out of Grand Blank, Michigan. 2337 has been a long-standing powerhouse in First Michigan with 11 event wins and has won a chairman's award at their last three years of districts. And today I'm here with Nate, Tyler, Jenna, and Christian. And we're going to be talking more about this uh, really cool 2020 run robot that's been built for some of the specific challenges at the out home challenges, including their intake, swerve, uh, their different, they actually had to add weight on this robot, which is really cool to talk about, and some of their programming as well, all here on Behind the Bumpers. Giving you a voice. Making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to the fun. fun. We would like to thank our friends at Stryker for supporting fun so we can continue to make content for you. Stryker is a leading medical device company and is looking for those in first to join their team as interns or for a great career. Come join a company that will actively support you being in first at careers.stryker.com. If you're on an FRC or FTC team and you're currently meeting safely in person and have a functional robot, we'd love to have you on our Behind the Bots or Behind the Bumper segments. Go ahead and reach out to us on any of our social channels, on Discord, or send us an email at admin at firstupdatesnow.com and let's get your team scheduled to be on First Updates Now. So Nate, starting out on this robot here, we're gonna talk about uh, maybe some of the decision process uh, to building this 2021 robot, because you took a little bit different approach than what we've seen on a lot of teams, where a lot of teams uh, went the route of, uh, they wanted to do everything for at-home challenges, but you decided to do something a little bit different. Tell us a bit more about your strategy, uh, and then also as well, things about the uh, design uh, that went into the robot. Yeah, so this year we actually went into the robot, and we knew that for rankings, you only needed three out of five competitions. And we knew that, if we added a shooter, we're adding height and probably widening our robot too in order to implement that. And so when we did that, we found that we actually, if we used our last year's robot, which was bigger, it slowed down our path. So what we actually decided this year was to go for the small robot. We went 17 inches by 17 inches on all sides. It was a giant, just tiny little square. The robot we found moved a lot faster than last year. And just the way it moved around the field was a lot smoother just by shrinking down that robot. So looking at the, the shrink, shrinking down, this is almost like an FTC robot size, right? Uh, so it's pretty cool to, to look at that. Uh, one of the things I want to ask you about on there is that when you build something this small, uh, you know, and we're going to be talking about your swerve driving a little bit as well, too. Sometimes uh, you need to add a little bit more control. And you guys did that by uh, adding some weight on your robot. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, your decision to do that? How much did you add and how did you experiment with how much uh, weight to add and where is that weight actually added? Yeah, so we actually added 70, 30 pounds to our robot. It was 70 pounds at first, and we added 30 pounds to the bottom. We added them through these plates at the bottom. I think they are each about six pounds. And adding them there allowed us to, it created more friction on the ground for our traction to like move around. It's that way these corners, we're not sliding around on, on the field. It allowed us for our tighter turns to gain that traction that we needed in order to make those precise turns needed. Um, I also see that your battery is, you know, really low in center as well, too. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the center of gravity of your robot, where that's located, and, and how you kind of work that out as well? Yeah, so we actually put our our battery. That was one of the hardest decisions. When we were actually building this robot, we went small. But when we did that, the battery was the weirdest location. Because with Swerve Drive, we're required with these four corners are taken up. And so we had to place that right in the middle. And we had to put it low to the ground so that way we could put our control panel in the middle, too and create all that power there. Because by putting it down in the middle, it actually allowed us for a lower and center, better center of gravity for our robot. And it actually created so the robot wouldn't move quite as much. Sure, and we do see your swerve drive there. We'll be getting into that in just a little bit. Uh, but next, I actually want to talk about uh, your intake that you have, because I think this is really unique with your robot, that you have an intake, but you don't really have a hopper or a shooter because you talked about how you only wanted to, you only need to complete five, three out of the five design challenges. So, uh, Tyler, talk to me about your intake a little bit and, and some of the decision making process to how that intake was established and and why maybe uh, you're like, hey, you know what, we're just going to keep them this way and we don't need to do anything else. Uh, yeah. So uh, one of our robots from 2017 uh, during Steamworks was this simple just slide out mechanism and allowed us to capture balls easily off the floor without uh, any issues. And so we implemented this design as it was very compact and it allowed us to intake balls very quickly and uh, anywhere on the field, really. So I know you guys have your uh, 2020 robot uh, behind you a little bit there. Can you talk about some of the differences between uh, the 2020 robot's uh, intake and then uh, this intake on Sidekick? Uh, yeah, so on our 2020, 20, our 20, 
2020 robot. Uh, we actually had an intake on each side and an open hopper design that allowed us to intake balls from the top, the bottom, uh, and basically from anywhere else. Uh, additionally, we also had a hopper and a shooter on this robot, where on this robot in uh, 2021, we don't have a hopper or a shooter. We just intake the balls. So uh, looking, you mentioned that in 2017, you had a similar uh, kind of that linear slide approach to it. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the specific uh, mechanisms that are on the intake? Like, can you talk a little bit more about the rollers uh, and uh, what's being used in? And we just saw a mechanism kind of go up and down a little bit. Talk to me a little bit more about that. Uh, yeah, so the slide mechanism is actually very simple, although it looks a little complex from the outside. All it is is a uh, double-sided rail and a piece just shoots out in the front and it just stays up permanently for the entire time we are doing our auton and it, uh, somebody just picks up nothing too complex. And then I, I'm not sure, it could be a, a deception for me from a camera perspective, but on the bottom of the intake, uh, it looks like you might either have something on your rollers or something was kind of moving there. You, what is actually on your rollers there? Can you talk about that? Uh, so basically what we did with the, uh, on each corner, you can see there's hooks. Those hooks are connected to ropes that are on the inside of the chassis. And uh, when we rotate the roller on the front, we actually uh, disconnect from the ropes and it'll shoot our intake out. That way it stays out and um, it just simply you know, does a job. Uh, and lastly, the, the follow up on this, when you're looking at designing this intake, you know, teams go through different iteration processes typically. Can you talk about uh, maybe what were a couple of the designs that you went through for this robot in particular for the intake? Actually, uh, our, our beginning design or our initial thought was to have two intakes. That way we could strafe and uh, pick up balls a lot easier from, uh, from some of the Auton challenges. But we decided, uh, based on our swerve drive modules, that we could just do one intake and get every single ball without an issue. Sure. Fair enough on there. Um, really cool design. I uh, love just, you know, it, as you mentioned, you know, like it looks like it has some complexity, but it's really a simple design and it's very effective and that's what matters uh, with this. So uh, next up, we, we kind of teased the swerve a little bit before. So we're going to be going over to Jenna, uh, who's going to be talking about uh, your swerve drive, what you have, how it works. Uh, so Jenna, I'd love to really hear some of the, the technical parts of it, uh, just like really what goes into it and some of the, the uh, successes uh, or even potentially uh, areas of opportunity you've had for it as well. Um, yeah, so one thing that we did change from last year compared to this year is that we're now using the Mark III swerve modules instead of the Mark II ones. So that means that the cannon quarters are different, that our position on the swerve module is different. It allows us to have a lot more accurate readings. Question for you on there is how often have you had to switch out the tread? Because we've been talking to teams who have used like the blue nitrile, for example, and they have to swap it out pretty frequently. How often are you swapping this out? So we've had to swap it out like three times, which isn't too bad, I wouldn't say. Um, we've done, like if you look at our carpet, you can see there are a lot of marks from the amount of runs that we've been doing. So they do kind of like scrub out over a while, but we hadn't had to do more than that, so. Fair enough. Can we, uh, can we flip the robot over and take a look underneath your uh, chassis just to see how the, the dry pods are configured there? Yeah, and last thing following up on this is that um, from looking back at for how long you guys have been doing Swerve Drive, uh, what are maybe some things or lessons learned that other teams could have as advice who are looking at doing Swerve Drive for the first time? Because we have a lot of teams in 2021 that they're looking to try new things, and one of them has been Swerve Drives, and we've seen some that have been very successful. And we've also seen some that have been not as successful. So talk to me about some of the successes that your team has had and how other teams might be able to apply that. So I think one thing that's really important to consider when making a swerve drive is to first determine like whether it's actually useful to make because i think some teams might think that it's very flashy or useful in general so they might want to try and go for it but if it's not strategically useful like if there's a lot of obstacles on the field for example or if it's not very flat it might actually be a disadvantage to go for a swerve drive that year another thing that we do consider is we wanted to make sure that they're really easy to like maintenance and whatnot, because if anything happens to it, we do try to have an extra swerve module available so that we can switch it out at any given moment. So another thing that like in the 2020 game, for example, they were the bars on the field. So we actually did design 
methods to protect our SWIR modules. And that'll be these black barrier busters, we like to call them over here. So there are actually these angled pieces so that if we would drive into the metal, it'll actually slide down the angle and it'll impact the swerve module much lower than if it would hit it higher on. So it actually helps protect from wear and tear a lot. Yeah, I really like that you showed that there because you can you can literally see where it's been hitting and you know you think about that instead of hitting your sword modules, it's now hitting that barrier instead. So that's that's really cool to see. Uh, appreciate you showing that. And then a lot of what you said goes back to what Nate was saying too, right? Strategy dictates design, and what you just mentioned makes a lot of sense with that. So, uh, so we're going to be wrapping up uh, with Christian, who's going to be talking about uh, a little bit of the programming in your robot, what you've been using for Pathweaver, and then also your Pixie Cam on your robot as well too. So Christian, talk to me a little bit more uh, about that and uh, how that's been useful for your team to be using. All right. So uh, for obviously this year, the challenge involves a lot of maneuvering of the robot around complex forces. So to do that, we use a Pathweaver program. And what we have done, we basically, we take an image of the actual layout recommended in the first manual, and then we take our robot's path and we can plug in different data, different coordinates, and a uh, code will run for us and tell us what the robot should do and how the robot should do it. We can easily modify it. So if we did a run, and we discovered that having this triangle farther out forward didn't result in as good of a time, we can simply pull it back, adjust the values, and try again. So there's a lot of trial and error with running these programs in order to find out what works best for our robot for a given challenge, and a lot of trying to just work out when the robot was comfortable doing it. We uh, mentioned the weights earlier. Those came up actually as a result of the programming where we were realizing we tried to turn around a corner, and the ro robot had the potential to go faster but the weight would actually prevent it from doing that. Either slide or it'd pop a wheelie and it'd just lose grip completely. So to help counter that, we added the weight and that allowed us to make the program more precise and get more out of the robot. So we're seeing the front there with the uh, Pixie Cam. Can you talk just a little bit more about, you know, what the Pixie Cam is and how you've been using that as benefit? Uh, sure, so Pixie Cam is right here on the front of our robot and uh, its purpose is basically to recognize it can do color and shape. We use it for mainly size actually. So when we start the robot, it's always in the same position. This is mainly in a galactic search. So with galactic search, you have to be able to recognize without changing the code, what path you are on. So we use the Pixie Cam because it can recognize from where it starts the size of the nearest ball. And depending on that size, it will identify, okay, this is the path I need to run. So for example, red A. And then it has a pre-programmed autonomous course it initiates and it will run through that path. And it can do that for all four in any scenario. So we never have to touch the code. The robot can just look with its own eyes essentially and run the path that it needs to. So Christian, I want to go back to uh, Pathfinder a little bit and talking about, uh, you know, barrier entry for teams. So, you know, a lot of teams who are looking to up their game a little bit and want to get into uh, different ways of doing programming, Pathfinder can be a great way for that to happen. So can you talk to me a little bit about uh, if you were to give advice to a team looking to get into Pathfinder for the first time, uh, how difficult is it? What uh, challenges have you had and what successes have you seen from it as well? All right, so Pathweaver is pretty great if you're just looking for a way to have a nice mapping system for your robot. Uh, especially if you use Tank Drive, essentially it will have the program ready for you, so you can just plug in your values, and as long as you do that correctly, you should be able to start adjusting and tweaking it however you like. We personally, uh, we got some issues from the fact we use a swerve drive, and uh, it does not come prepared for a swerve drive. So we had to uh, spend a couple weeks just making minor adjustments until we found a good system that we felt was accurate and did the robot justice in terms of how it handled and from there, we were able to get to the point where we could plug numbers in and just modify the small coordinates and get what we wanted. So if you're using a system that's uh, not necessarily the norm or something individual to the challenge, then that could come up. And you will have to account for that, but it shouldn't be too hard. And you should be able to relatively quickly and with a relative amount of ease get into this yourself. Well, 2337, thanks again uh, for taking the time to tell us about this really cool uh, 2021 robot uh, that you designed for specific at-home challenges. Uh, I love that uh, you went for what you felt was best, and that's really cool to be able to see uh, the different aspects and attributes and what went into this robot. So thanks for taking the time. Uh, good luck as all the at-home challenges results get put out, and can't wait to see uh, your robot in future seasons as well. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, we would like to thank our friends at Stryker for supporting this video. Stryker is looking for current and future FIRST alumni to join their internship program and FIRST mentors who are looking for a great career with a company who actually supports their FIRST journey. Go to careers.stryker.com to learn more. You can also directly support FUND by joining FUND Nation.
Click the join button and just for a few bucks a month, you unlock special perks and directly support us so we can keep making great content. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now and check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.